a long time ago. Um, then in 1964, Pigeon Goldie Osgood, um, she was a long-term resident of the Cecil, was found dead in her room. She had been raped, stabbed, beaten, and her room was completely ransacked. They did, however, find Jock B. Ellinger. He was charged with the murder originally as he was walking around the streets covered in blood. Nice. You know, so Well, that's... that's I mean... It's a very subtle, you know, nudge in the direction of the killer. But I'm going to go with he probably did it. Well, um, apparently they figured that he wasn't a suspect and they cleared him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. So to this day, her, oh. rema- her murder still remains unsolved. Where did the blood come from? Exactly. And in the 60s, I believe we were at least able to type blood. To see if the blood all over him matched the type. And even now, if they saved any evidence whatsoever, we could totally do DNA testing on that. But what do I know? I'm not wow. I was like, what else do you have to do to, to be guilty? <laughs> You're right? walking around <laughs> covered in blood. You just came from, what, a tea party? It's like, <laughs> I don't know. I woke up and I looked Or down you could do this, the infamous, Huh? What are you talking about? I didn't do anything. Maybe that's what he did, and that's why he wasn't convicted. That's what I'm going to do, like, the next time you're like, Kelly, you got something on your cheek, and I'm like, I think you're lying. (laughs) (laughs) I don't believe you. (laughs) So then in the 1980s, I guess some people may have heard about him, Richard Ramirez. So they called him the Night Stalker, Mm -hmm. and, you know, he... He, he was just a total weirdo. <laughs> so he was actually a really long-term resident of the Cecil. They believe he hunted for his victims in the area that surrounded the Cecil, and some believe that he would bring some of his victims to the hotel and kill them in his room. But on August 30th, 1985, so he's been staying there quite a bit, a group of L.A., Residents had seen Ramirez walking on the street, and they prevented him from escaping until the police could arrive and arrest him. I saw that. I saw that. I don't remember if it was a YouTube or it was a movie movie on, like, Netflix or something, but I do remember that. They held him down. I think they tied him up and everything. Good for them. There's a documentary on Netflix, so I'm like, that's probably one we'll... Well, right now, it's a little too popular, so it's like, I don't want to... Because people have probably listened to other podcasts that have had it on there. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many. And it's because Netflix just aired it. So I'm like, we'll give it time to cool down. Honestly, though, I'm more more excited about hearing how these people took matters into their own hands. You know? Right. They're they're heroes. That's why I said. I'm like, it's kind of like the people that held down Dahmer. That is so cool. Remember? Because they... They held him down so the police could get him. But normally, nowadays, people look the other way because they don't want to get involved. Exactly. Not me. I'm all up in there. Yeah. I'll I'll sit and... You'll cut a bitch. Oh, I definitely would cut a bitch. I knew you would. Especially when you're on your way home from work because you're in a mood. Anyway. <laughs> so, they did capture him. And then in 18, uh, 1989... He was actually convicted of 13 murders and sentenced to death in a gas chamber. I'm not going to give any ways spoilers because, like I said, this will be something we will cover eventually. So in 1991, they actually had another serial killer. His name was Jack Ungweger of Austria, who stayed at the Cecil, and they believed he was a copycat of Ramirez because he attacked anybody but ultimately he had strangled and killed at least three sex workers and he would later be charged and convicted in his homeland of austria oh so i think that's going to be another interesting story i think i'm going to cover just to kind of see how things played out over in austria yeah because why is he being charged for a crime from america in his country that's true I, i think it's interesting and then the one that's gained the most notoriety was that of Elisa Lamb. So this one I wanted to go in a little detail with because I wanted to cover her story, so I felt it was a really good time. So Elisa Lamb, 
was a Canadian student who was visiting L.A. in 2013. By this time, the Cecil had been rebranded to the Stay on Main. So she went into this new place. So her parent, she was born April 30th, 1991, and she was the daughter of immigrants from Hong Kong. She checked into the Stay on Main on January 28th, 2013. She had arrived in L.A. on the 26th, and when she first checked in, I thought this was really weird. She was assigned to a shared room. In 2020? And uh, this was 2013. Okay. It's a 700-room hotel. I'm not getting that. And I, I didn't even think there was such a thing of that anymore. Well, and screw that. I'm not staying with complete no. strangers. This I don't even like hostel. to share a room with anybody now. I know. I'm, <laughs> it's, oh, it's so, I love having hotel rooms. I know. But no, I'm not staying with complete strangers. Yeah, I, that's why I, don't even, I wouldn't even stay at a bed and breakfast because I don't want to share a bathroom. And I don't want people like interacting with me. I just want to be left alone. <laughs> that's why I'm at a hotel to begin with. <laughs> That's why you do podcasts, because you don't like anybody bothering you, right? Right, Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So, thankfully, she was enough of a quote-unquote weirdo that the roommates had complained to management, and um, Lamb was actually given her own room, which, I'd do the same thing. Maybe she was an asshole, so she could get her own room. It's like prison. You You would do that. the craziest, or you gotta beat up... Mm-hmm. The biggest person there, squeaky wheel, right? So right. I'm with. I would have acted like a crazy person. I would so act crazy to get into Florida, like on Orange Is the New Black. Oh, Remember, that's, right. that's where the older people go. Yep, and it's calm there, and it's like Florida. Ugh, I would so do that. So humid and buggy down there. I know, but it's better than being shanked in your sleep. Anyway. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, off topic again. So during her stay, she actually checked in with her family and she would put updates on. She had a Tumblr account, which I'm not really sure what Tumblr is, but it's I don't either. some kind of It social. must be sort of like a Snapchat or something. Or like or a, MySpace. Or even like an Instagram. But she was able to like schedule things. So she had like pictures and stuff come out. So she was supposed to check out February 1st, but she had never contacted her family. So immediately, her family actually called the LAPD, and they took the first flight they could to L.A. to help search for their daughter. Which I'm like, good for them. It wasn't like, oh, well, she'll call us later. She'll tear a nap. (laughs) Nope, you follow your gut. Yep. So the police started with a search of the entire hotel. Well, they did search the entire hotel, but there were only legally allowed to do so much of it so they didn't get to search in every room um they actually did bring a cadaver dog into lamb's room but the dog lost the scent at the windows and the door and things like that so it was very strange they then took the dogs up to the roof and they couldn't pick up the scent either so as of february 6th the police were like okay she's been missing for five days at this point we need help So, let's go back a little bit, because on the February 1st, Lamb was seen by security footage in an elevator acting really strange. She was, like, pushing the buttons, peeking out, and then she'd go out, and then she'd come in, and she's standing up against a thing, like she's hiding from somebody. And I watched the special on Netflix. It is scary. Like, you could tell she was scared. I saw that. I remember this now because these all start to go to like meld together. She was pushing all the buttons. She was like doing very erratically jumping out of the elevator and looking down the hall and then getting back on. And she was just acting like she saw somebody or she was trying to keep away from somebody. Right. And Almost like, like she was being like um, paranoid. Yeah, and then, like, where she's, like, sitting yeah, she, up against it so people, like, like nobody could see yeah. her. That, it was, like, it freaked me out because I was watching it before we started, and it's just, like, she's peeking out. And then in some conspiracy theories, there's this game that people play on elevators where it's supposed to bring you into an alternate reality or 
I don't know. So some people thought that maybe that was it. So eventually the security um, footage was actually released to the public, and this was on the 15th, so she's been missing for two weeks. So the cops put this up, and the it, it's about two and a half minutes, give or take, and the video like went viral immediately, and there were all these theories floating around. So you see, like we said, you see her peeking around the doors, and she come out and go back in. Um, and it is known that Lamb suffered from um, bipolar disease. Oh, maybe she wasn't on her meds, and that's why she was acting like that. Oh, she was on her meds, so we'll find that out later. So Ooh. that was another thing. So people thought maybe, oh, okay, this is a psychotic break. Um, another theory was that game where you can go into the elevator. Again, I know nothing about this, and I get it that some of us really need to hope that this place isn't reality. So maybe, I don't know, maybe she was playing the game. Um, then other people felt like the video was tampered with before it was released, which is always a possibility. Yeah, you, you know, nothing's 100%. And it's hard to see the timestamp and things like that when you're actually watching it. So I, I get that people would be hesitant about that. And, you know, at one point she does get out and she kind of stands in front of, like, the middle of the elevator. So all you see is, like, like of one of her arms, like you can see the sleeve of her shirt. So it's like, was she talking to somebody? So was there like a psycho or a creeper outside? Because then she comes in and tries to hide after that. So it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's all so weird. But if somebody was fucking with her, that's just mean. And why wouldn't the doors close? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's just, I remember this now. A lot, and I remember looking at that, and it was just, she was looked like she was so scared. I was scared for her, because I was like, and then I'm like, where are the stairs? You know what I mean? Like, I would have run for the stairs, or something like that, but if there's somebody out there, and you're trying to get away quick. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I I felt really bad. So, it, the video really didn't lead to any tips that would actually bring the family answers. So, now we're over two weeks since she's been seen alive. Some of the guests at this point started to complain of contaminated water coming from the faucets. So, the, um, actually, this led to Santiago Lopez. He was one of the maintenance workers. Um, He went up to the roof to inspect the hotel's water tanks. This poor guy notices that one of the tanks' lids open. So, he goes and he opens up this thousand-gallon water tank to discover Lamb's body floating in the tank. And this tank in particular supplied water to the guest rooms, the kitchen, and the coffee shop. Uh. Yeah. So, there's a lot of questions surrounding that, but they found her face up. Usually, a drowning victim... Will go face down. Right. So, I thought it was a little bizarre that she was found face up, I guess, you know, with decomp and things like that. Maybe the body... Could have flipped, or if there's some kind of mechanism in there, maybe the water movement caused her body to flip, something like that. But they actually had to drain the tank and cut it open so that they were able to get her body out. How'd she get in there? If, if that's so, that's some stuff we're going to talk about in here in a few minutes. Because if you had to get cut, if it had to get cut to get her out, well, remember she was in there for a while. So she okay. I don't want to go into details, but yeah. you get a little bigger. Yep. So the L.A. coroner actually deemed this an accidental drowning on February 21st, and he noted that the bipolar disorder was a significant factor, which, how could you know that? If you're that? on your meds, though. Exactly. Yeah, and how would he know that? Well, here's the thing. So her talk screen showed that she had been taking all of her meds, she didn't have any illicit drugs in her system, and her alcohol level was 0.02. So it's she, like next to nothing. I say she could have taken Nyquil. Okay. For you know what I mean, like yeah. that's not a lot of alcohol whatsoever. So this the some of the conspiracy theories about the elevator were that maybe she was on ecstasy or something that was like some hallucinogen that was freaking her out, but they didn't find anything in her system. So, the issues surrounding this case is, one, how the hell did she get into the water tank? 
because the hotel had it so that 